It's late evening at Heathrow Airport. In the Terminal 3 car park, an abandoned suitcase is found by two women who are heading off on holiday. But when police open the case, they're shocked to discover the bloody body of a young woman. They urgently need to find out who she is and who might be responsible for such a savage attack. The discovery of a young woman's body at one of the world's busiest airports is both shocking and grotesque. This horrendous crime will undoubtedly trigger media interest and the scrutiny will be immense. The pressure is on and as the body was left at an airport, the killer could be anywhere. Catching a killer requires conclusive forensic evidence. From clues at the scene of the crime to minute examination in the forensics lab. From the cold reality of the pathologist table to DNA sampling, digital analysis. Each piece of killer evidence brings the murderer closer to justice. Saturday, 17th of July, 1999. It's the first weekend of the school holidays and Heathrow Airport is full of families looking forward to getting away for a summer break. But in the car park of Terminal 3, an abandoned piece of luggage changes the course of senior investigating officer John Corrigan's day. Suitcase was abandoned on the trolley. Two holiday makers made contact after seeing the suitcase with the local security. Normal practice when you force open a suitcase is that you find clothing, personal items, etc. along those lines. On this occasion, it was a female's body dressed in a white robe. Total shock. This was a frenzied attack. She fought for her life. This is now a murder investigation. The crime scene is sealed off and the body in the suitcase becomes the first piece of evidence. Detectives are trying to understand why anyone would leave a body in an airport car park. I just walked around it, get my head around it, and try to identify how he'd arrived or how they had arrived to dispose of the body. But trying to find evidence to solve a murder in one of the busiest airports in the world is a daunting task. The possibility of contamination by travelers passing through the scene is so high. Normal practice is um, when there's a body recovered, it's left in situ. We refer to it as the scene is frozen. Don't move anything. On this occasion, because of the location and decisions that were made, it was removed rather quickly to Ealing Hospital. The extent of the woman's visible wounds and the lack of blood in the airport car park tells investigators that the site where her body has been found is not where she was killed. If she sustained any sort of injuries that have damaged arteries or major vessels, then that gives us an opportunity for blood to be projected from that artery. So in this particular case, I'm, I'm, I would have a high expectation that there would be what we call projected blood in that crime scene. But forensic officers find no such blood spatter and no murder weapon in the airport car park. Now police must work out why the killer chose such a busy place to dispose of the body if they're to discover who committed this vicious murder. It's not unusual for people having committed murder to then immediately want to dispose of the body. In this case, instead of actually getting rid of the body and placing it perhaps into a river, into a bit of hidden ground, into a forest, he placed it into a forest full of CCTV cameras, police and law enforcement. That is at an airport. In the heat of the moment, it would make a fairly logical choice to put a body in a suitcase in order to be able to remove it from the scene. Of course, the difficulties are that bodies are exceptionally heavy, and therefore you may draw attention to yourself by carrying an excessively heavy suitcase. But it does, in some bizarre way, make perfect sense to go to somewhere where there are lots of other suitcases, potentially, like Terminal 3 at Heathrow, because you're going to blend in even if you're dragging a suitcase. Police have drawn a blank at the airport, 
with only one piece of evidence, the woman's body in the suitcase. To make any progress in the investigation, they must identify her. The only way that we could get this body identified at this stage was to get an artist's impression of the face of the victim. We had to go to press and ask for assistance on this matter. A female abandoned in a suitcase at Heathrow Airport definitely grabbed the attention. For any police force, the admission that they need the help of the public is admission that they are operating um, on a very thin evidential landscape. They have a body, but they cannot advance the inquiry without identifying who the victim is. It is a double-edged sword because it also gives an opportunity to inform the perpetrator uh, what the police know and also gives the perpetrator an opportunity to flee before they can be caught and maybe even to perhaps kill again. The public have a duty to assist police. Certainly in the more serious cases, the public are often very, very helpful and keen uh, to get involved. You potentially pick up new witnesses, you get information that you may not have known previously, and it gives you further lines of inquiry. One of the drawbacks is it isn't unusual for people to phone up and claim they're the killer or they know who the killer was or anything to distract from the investigation. So it's a decision that has to be taken very carefully. The artist's impression of the murder victim is quickly splashed across the papers. And the very next day, police get their first lead. Metropolitan Police were contacted on Monday the 19th of July by the victim's cousin. The cousin was contacted by family members in Canada because our victim was due to travel to Canada on the uh, uh, late evening of the 17 early hours of the 18th and didn't turn up in Canada. The victim is Fatima Kama, a 28-year-old Canadian citizen originally from Morocco. Her cousin had seen Fatima that afternoon and planned to meet up with her the night she was killed, but couldn't get hold of her. His statement to police would prove to be the second piece of evidence. The cousin was telling us that Fatima Kama had come to London a week previously from Canada. She was a singer and she was visiting various clubs in the West End. The description that people have talked about her was a uh, Holly Golightly uh, type individual. She was the centre of attention. She was an attractive young lady and drew people to her. Identifying Fatima Kama is a major breakthrough for the police in their investigation. Once the police identify the victim, they build up a map around this person, uh, the people she knows, the people she loves, her family, her, uh, her landlord, everybody that comes into contact with her. Once you begin to build that map, you can then start to identify a potential cast of suspects. Fatima's cousin tells police that she had been living in a flat in Paddington. She was living in Portsea Hall. Um, Paddington area. She shared it with another male by the name of um, Yusuf Wahid. She covered the daytime hours, so it was a 12-hour period that she lived in the flat, and Yusuf Wahid slept at night there. Two days after Fatima's body is found, police break into her flat. It was Monday evening, about 9 o'clock, that we went to the premises. We knocked on the door, there was no answer, it was forced open. We entered under the authority of the warrant. As officers enter the apartment, they're immediately suspicious because it's so clean. Someone has given it a very thorough going over. We identified that it was definitely a crime scene. Something had happened here. What? We weren't sure. We decided that this scene was to be sealed and forensics were called to do the necessary tests. Investigators believe that someone has tried to conceal evidence. Despite the cleanup, forensic officers are able to lift fingerprints for analysis. This is the third piece of evidence. The way that fingerprint identification works is based on the ridged skin that you have right across your palms, all the way to the ends of your fingers, and also on the soles of your feet. A finger mark on the handle of a knife simply tells you that the person 
to whom that finger mark belongs has touched the handle of the knife. It has no indication of activity. It doesn't say what they did with it. It doesn't mean that somebody who was wearing gloves or somebody who doesn't readily donate finger marks hasn't handled it before or since. You can't date the finger mark that you find on it. All you can say is that finger mark on that exhibit belongs to that person. And that's where forensic science ends. Investigators will only be able to match these finger marks to a suspect if that person's prints are in the National Fingerprint Database. But they will later become crucial in the case. And as the team work their way through every inch of the flat, they also discover traces of blood in the carpet and on the skirting boards. When you puncture someone with a knife, blood will splatter over the crime scene area. This had happened in various places in the apartment. Once that blood has started to soak into surfaces, it becomes almost impossible to remove it. It leaves an indelible trace. The traces of blood found at the flat become the fourth piece of evidence. They are sent away for DNA analysis. In Fatima's case, you've got that added complication of understanding whether or not her own house, her own flat, is the site of assault. Because in any domestic setting, you would expect your DNA to be present. So the presence of DNA on its own does not help in that context. But of course, in this particular circumstance, we had lots of blood. And that blood was the thing that allowed the police to say, this is the site of assault. This is where she died. This is where she lost significant amounts of blood. And then she's been moved using the suitcase to the airport. And it was that finding of blood that allowed them to say, this is the crime scene. Farag Harama lived there. Who else was there? Who did she know? Who did she not know? That's where we started developing the case accordingly. Who was she associated with? So now we had potentially the crime scene at the airport. Now we've gone to second crime scene in Paddington. How did we get from Paddington to the airport? and what happened prior to the events at Paddington. Police now know where Fatima died, but they still don't have a suspect. They urgently need to speak to her flatmate, Youssef Wahid, a 30-year-old former flight attendant from Lebanon. Police are hunting the killers of Fatima Kama, whose body was callously crammed into a suitcase and left at Heathrow Airport. As investigators search her last known address, a prime suspect arrives at the scene. Police are investigating the murder of a young woman whose body was found at Heathrow Airport in a padlocked suitcase. A cousin has identified the woman as 28-year-old singer Fatima Kama. And at her apartment, detectives have taken fingerprints and blood spatter for analysis. The police have had their first major breakthrough in the case. But with the press and public clamouring for justice, the investigators are feeling the pressure. But they must keep their cool. If they don't carefully examine the evidence, they risk damaging the case, or worse, making a mistake that might allow a killer to walk free. Two days after Fatima was discovered at Heathrow Airport, Forensic officers are searching her flat in Paddington when an unexpected visitor arrives. We were aware um, when we were in the address, as we've spoken to the um, concierge downstairs, that there were residents in that flat. We were aware that there was a regular party who we identified as Adele. Adele turned up. Because forensics had been recovered from the scene, we thought that he was responsible for it. So he was arrested on suspicion of murder. Adele is Yusuf Wahid's younger brother, as well as Fatima's landlord and an obvious suspect. He is taken to Paddington Police Station and detectives begin to question him, but he only tells them what they already know. He gives an account as to his access to the property. He highlighted that he had responsibilities for managing the property and that Fatima Kama and his brother Yusuf Wahid 
were residential there. He didn't answer any question after that. We haven't got any evidence uh, at this stage to lay a charge. What we've got is grounds of reasonable suspicion that this individual may be responsible for a murder. I had to go to court to get an extension of Adele Wahid uh, in police detention. That was achieved. He was charged the following evening. While Adele Wahid is held in police custody, detectives also continue to investigate other possible suspects. Fatima's cousin tells them that she had a wealthy and generous boyfriend. In the week that she was in London, we were aware that she travelled to several nightclubs and that she had a number of admirers, one in particular. He very, very simply liked her, enjoyed her company, and they were very compatible. In essence, most people are killed by uh, people they know. Most uh, female victims of homicide are killed by uh, their partners. So it's a starting point for the police to look at the relationships, and in particular with female victims of murder, their intimate relationships. So the first instance, who was Fatima's boyfriend? Who is she sleeping with? Who was uh, her ex-boyfriend? Who would want to sleep with her and maybe has been denied that opportunity? It's not a very complex uh, map for the police to operate from, but it's a very practical map. But the first point in any murder inquiry involving a uh, brutal attack on a beautiful young woman, it's going to be her partner and her boyfriend. That's the starting point. It always is. However, when police question Fatima's new admirer, he is entirely cooperative and appears genuinely upset. He was straightforward in respect to the relationship that they had, that he had supported her financially, and that he had purchased a ticket for her and other presents over the period of the week, and that she was going to go back to Canada and come back and stay with him for a while in London later that month. We hadn't eliminated him, but what we were um, satisfied with was what there was an accountability at this stage. Police now have two possible suspects who knew Fatima and saw her in the days before her murder. But they have no concrete evidence against either of them. Crucially, there is a third man they want to speak to. Fatima's flatmate, Youssef Wahid. But he has disappeared. Investigators decide to go back to basics and create a timeline for Fatima's last hours using her phone records. The phone records only gave us a time in relation to uh, the contact between Fatima Karma and her family members. Gave us an approximate time as to when the last communication was with her. Fatima's phone records are the fifth piece of evidence. They show that the last call she had was with her sister in Canada at 8 p.m. and she made it from her flat. They now know she must have died between 8 and 10.30 p.m when the suitcase was found at the airport. What we had to do was prove how the body transferred from Paddington to Heathrow. The concierge at her apartment building reveals that he not only saw Fatima's missing flatmate, Yusuf Wahid, on the evening she disappeared, he also helped load his heavy suitcase into a taxi. We were aware from the porter at Portacy Hall concierge that a taxi had been called at about nine o'clock Yusuf Wahid left the property to go to Paddington railway station the concierge's statement is the sixth piece of evidence Yusuf Wahid is now detectives third suspect but he's still missing at this stage, the police have a holy trinity of suspects. They've got Adele, the landlord, who walks onto the crime scene and is immediately arrested. He's obviously got some questions to answer. There is the boyfriend, who seemingly exceedingly cooperative and very distraught at the murder of his partner. And the third person in this holy trinity of suspects is, of course, Youssef. This is the flatmate, Fatima's flatmate. They don't understand quite the relationship that they had. All they know is that he's fled the country or he's disappeared. He cannot be tracked down or traced. Inevitably, the detectives are going to light their attention onto Youssef and say, hmm, wherever you are, this man has got some questions to answer. 
certain that one of these three men killed Fatima, officers searching through CCTV are now specifically looking for any of them travelling to Heathrow with a suitcase. There were three locations that we had to focus on, Paddington Railway Station, the Express and Heathrow Airport. Three officers were tasked with that. They focused on the particular times in question and we were able to achieve a timeline from Paddington Railway Station to Heathrow. There are thousands and thousands of hours of footage from CCTV that has to be looked at. When you say to one of your detectives, you are the CCTV coordinator, they know they and somebody else and possibly two or three or four other officers are going to sit for hours in a dark room in front of a TV or a computer screen and look virtually frame by frame every single camera for hours and hours and hours on end. Can't be fast forwarded, it's got to be done in real time. But finally the police studying the CCTV have a breakthrough. They spot the suitcase at Heathrow Airport and the man pushing it along is Youssef Wahid, the missing flatmate. Once we had the CCTV, we were able to establish that Yusuf Wahid was an individual of concern. And once we identified Wahid at Heathrow Airport, we were able to identify his journey from Paddington Railway Station to abandoning the suitcase at Heathrow Airport. The CCTV does not show anyone other than Yusuf Wahid handling the suitcase on the journey from Fatima's flat in Paddington to Heathrow Airport. The CCTV is the seventh piece of evidence. It's clear that Youssef Wahid is somehow involved in the death of Fatima Kama. He was seen with the suitcase, but the police still need the killer evidence to prove whether or not he was responsible for her murder. Investigators have found a suitcase containing the body of Fatima Kama in the car park at Heathrow Airport. They have her cousin's statement. They have taken fingerprints and blood samples from her rented flat in Paddington. Phone records confirm the last call she made was two and a half hours before her body was found. And the concierge at the apartment block says he helped Fatima's flatmate, Yusuf Wahid, load a large suitcase into a cab. CCTV shows Yusuf moving the suitcase containing her body from her apartment to Heathrow. Yusuf Wahid is effectively on the run. He's wanted for questioning after CCTV shows him with the suitcase containing Fatima's body. But that doesn't prove he murdered Fatima Kama. In order to launch a successful prosecution, the police need to be sure who killed her and have the evidence to prove it. As detectives piece together the clues they have so far, they're becoming more confident that Fatima's latest love interest is not involved with her death and can eliminate him from the investigation. This was a genuine individual who was very concerned for him because he was a great admirer of hers. Well, he was very upset. He had great plans for her for the future. He admired her greatly, and he wanted a relationship with her. And we were satisfied that he was not personally responsible at that stage. We know that from people that we spoke to, that this relationship was going to continue. She had a sponsor uh, for the future, so she was a happy young lady. Police investigate the possible motives for Fatima's murder and whether the money and expensive gifts from her wealthy new admirer may have made her a target. We're aware that previous 24 hours, she'd attended a bank safety deposit where she recovered money and jewelry. She'd be given presents that week through her admirer. Um, we know that that was probably taken back to the flat and that possibly was a motive for her death. If the motive you determine is cash or jewellery or some other acquisitive crime, then it could be somebody more remote from the victim, but who knew enough about them to know that they had um, access to, to cash or jewellery. All of that is very useful to the investigator. 
none of that makes any difference to the court when they're determining sentence. Some people need a motive for murder, some people murder for the hell of it, some people murder for love, for passion, some people murder for property, for fraud, for theft. It's a very complicated matrix. In this case, it seems, it's a mixed matrix. It was so violent, so despicably horrible, so brutal, it would seem to me that it has to be an element of passion to it perhaps uh, rejection and inevitably of course Fatima had tens of thousands of pounds of cash and jewelry on her possession all of which disappeared so one might conjecture that also was a motive what moves someone to stab someone 27 times and then slit them across the throat that is another level entirely while detectives try to work out the motive for Fatima's murder test results from the post-mortem come back the results prove that Fatima had sex just before her death. It's not clear whether this was consensual or if she'd been assaulted. I think juries often see DNA as a barcode of guilt. They think, oh, his DNA was there. That means that he's done it. And it doesn't necessarily mean anything at all. DNA from a body fluid is different. It's easier to interpret if you find semen on an intimate swab from a victim there are only a few ways that that could have happened. The DNA results do take detectives closer to the identity of her murderer. We had taken a blood sample, or DNA sample, from Adele. What we could say is that the DNA sample on Fatima Kama's body was not Adele's. It was someone very close to her. It was a family member of Adele that had left the DNA, DNA sample on Fatima Kama. The DNA results are the killer evidence police have been looking for. The case against Adele Wahid's brother, Youssef, is compelling. Now all the police have to do is find him. CCTV footage is their best chance of tracking him down. But after he's captured on camera at Heathrow on the 17th of July with the suitcase, he seems to disappear. We lost track of them. There's no doubts about that. We, we tried to retrieve it, but um, there's certain areas that weren't covered by CCTV, um, but he just disappeared. My thinking at that stage was there's a possibility that this individual had abandoned the suitcase, had got into one of the terminals and got on a flight. Police continue to troll the CCTV, and when they finally catch a glimpse of Youssef Wahid again, he's at Heathrow but it's on the morning after he abandoned the suitcase. And this time, he's not alone. One of Heathrow's car park cameras picks up Yusuf Wahid in a car with his brother, Adele. Wahid traveled to Heathrow Airport with his brother, Adele. They travel in Adele's car. We were able to identify him through a photograph at the parking area. He went in the car park, photograph is taken of the individual who, who picks up the ticket. We were able to identify Yusuf and Adele Wahid as the driver and passenger. What stood out differently from the night in before was that he'd shaved off his moustache. He went to the Lebanese Airways desk, purchased a ticket for £457 and travelled back to Beirut. This CCTV showing Yusuf Wahid has changed his appearance the day after Fatima's murder is their ninth piece of evidence. Back in 1999, there was no facial recognition, so the job isn't being done by highly complex computers. So it was easy enough to escape detection by simply changing something small about your appearance. Uh, there's something curious here is that even though a moustache might seem very small to us and a very small change in his visage, in his appearance, it might have been something much more profound um, uh, to Youssef. For him, his moustache may have been a very strong part of his masculinity, a, a really important part of his identity. So he might have thought that actually by removing his moustache, it might have had an amplified, a much bigger impact than it actually did. It's four days since Fatima's body was found, and the CCTV footage means police are now convinced that Yusuf Wahid is her murderer. On Wednesday, we were certain as to who the individual that was responsible for the murder. 
Yusuf Wahid, and his brother Adele was responsible for cleaning up the apartment. Police also find some of Fatima's clothes in the boot of Adele's car. Assisting an offender is an offence in UK law. And that basically means that if you know or believe someone to be guilty of an offence and you do anything to impede their arrest or prosecution, you can be found guilty of that offence. In a case of murder, where the sentence is fixed by law, anybody found guilty of assisting an offender could go to prison for a maximum of 10 years. Yusuf has returned home to Lebanon and police must now involve the authorities there if they're to bring him to justice. I had to go to the Lebanese embassy um, to find out about Wahid and also find out in relation to what the law was in the respective country. Could he be extradited or not? Although Yusuf Wahid has fled to the Lebanon, he's left behind a trail of evidence that points directly to him as the killer of Fatima Kama. The authorities are certain they have the right man. Now the police face the challenge of taking their investigation to an international domain. The body of a young nightclub singer, Fatima Kama, discovered in a suitcase at Heathrow, has caused international outcry. Police have identified the most likely suspect as her flatmate, Youssef Wahid, and have already collected a wealth of evidence. The testimony from Fatima's cousin leads them to the flat, where forensics take fingerprint samples and find blood spatter. Phone records have helped narrow down the time frame during which she must have been killed. Police have a statement from the concierge who says he helped Yusuf Wahid load a heavy suitcase into a taxi and CCTV footage shows the suitcase being taken to the airport and abandoned. There's DNA from a close relative of Adele Wahid on the singer's body. And finally... There is CCTV showing Yusuf Wahid has changed his appearance within hours of the murder and is leaving the country. Yusuf Wahid was last seen boarding a flight to Beirut on the day after he suspected of killing Fatima Kama. In order to ensure he faces justice for his crimes, the authorities must now launch a manhunt on an international scale. And it's not only a matter of liaising with those chasing the killer, the Canadian authorities must also be briefed so that Fatima's family can be updated. The murder occurred in London. The Metropolitan Police were responsible for the investigation. The Foreign and Commonwealth Office had to be briefed on certain aspects. Ambassadors had to be briefed. Senior management at the Metropolitan Police had to be briefed of the progress. Did I feel pressure? Absolutely. Did the Metropolitan Police feel pressure? 100%. Although Yusuf Wahid has fled the country, detectives in London are determined to catch their killer. Metropolitan Police Commander Andy Baker now takes control of the case. We got the Crown Prosecution Service senior prosecutor to look at the evidence. He agreed that it was a solid case. So we were ready to go. All we needed to do was find Yusuf. Yusuf Wahid is now their only murder suspect and complex negotiations with the Lebanese authorities begin. The investigation team um, had approached Lebanon, uh, the authorities there, informing them of the murder and the fact that the key, key person of interest, the suspect, was Yusuf Wahid that was believed to be in Beirut. And the Lebanese authorities decided to go out and arrest him. The arrest in Lebanon is a massive boost for the British detectives. They are hopeful that Yusuf Wahid will finally be brought to justice. If anyone's murdered in the UK, they could be tried for murder in the UK. But if a British subject murders someone abroad, they could be tried in the UK for that murder abroad. Other countries have corresponding... Um, laws, same as the UK. So it meant that in Lebanon, Yusuf Wahid, being a Lebanese national, 
murdering someone in the UK be, could be tried in Lebanon for that murder. But any trial of Wahid in Lebanon brings with it a political dilemma. The British authorities were reluctant to be involved in any case whereby a person could be sentenced to death for murder. Quite understandably, with the abolition of capital punishment in the UK, uh, the CPS and the government does not want to cooperate uh, with the application of uh, that sentence in any other jurisdiction, particularly in relation to crimes which have been committed on UK terrain. The Crown Prosecution Service said it's very difficult for us to pursue a case in Lebanon, so I asked them what can we do about it? He said, well, you can go to your authorities, and if they agree not to carry out a death sentence, then we could assist them. The Lebanese authorities eventually agreed to drop the death penalty, and their officers travelled to the Wahid family home just south of Beirut with a warrant for Youssef's arrest. But true to form, he's nowhere to be found. It's a crushing blow to the investigation team. Yet again, Youssef has evaded capture. So we now had UK police, Scotland Yard, chasing you, Yusuf Wahid. We had the Lebanese authorities waiting for Yusuf Wahid to return to his uh, family home. And we had the Canadian authorities on behalf of um, Fatima's family wanting to know what had happened. All this focus was on us. At the same time, my job was to make sure that we had the evidence to hand, the evidence that stood up, the evidence that would be ready to satisfy the authorities there that we were doing our job to the best of our ability to bring it to justice. The upshot is that wherever he travels, wherever he now sets up home, the police, the CPS, the British authorities are ready to go with an extraordinary, compelling bundle of evidence that is sure to convict him in nearly any jurisdiction for the murder of Fatima. But their failure to locate Youssef Wahid means the Crown Prosecution Service can't mount a case against his brother Adele for assisting an offender. Adele had been charged with assisting his brother to escape uh, and to clean up the scene of the crime. The Crown Prosecution Service said we're not going to pursue the case against Adele was because Youssef was at large. And it's really unusual to convict someone for assisting an offender when you haven't got the actual offender. But detectives aren't giving up on finding Youssef. I've been approached by a detective inspector. He wanted to set up a small unit of basically just him and one other to manhunt people down. And he wanted to call this Artemis, who is the hunter in mythology. Um, and he said he heard that Youssef Wahid may be a good first subject. Dave Hurley from the Artemis team heads out to the Middle East to track down Yusuf Wahid, who has now been on the run for nearly three years. Social media was beginning to come to the fore, so he started doing some checks and, and, and traces. And he ascertained that Yusuf Wahid, wherever he was in the world, was in regular contact with his mother and brother back in Lebanon. The Artemis team chase Wahid all over the Middle East, but he keeps slipping through their fingers. Months, then years go by. Then eventually, nearly 11 years after Fatima's murder, Commander Andy Baker gets a phone call. I heard nothing until August 2010 when Dave Hurley phoned me up and said, we found him. I said, found who? He said, Yusuf Wahid. He's in Bahrain. We're so close to him now, we can put a key logger on his computer that he's using, whereby we know when he's at the screen, tapping away to his mother or brother in the Lebanon. I got a phone call a few days later to say that David Hurley walked up to him at a desk in an office in Bahrain with the Bahrainian police force and arrested Yusuf Wahid for the murder of Fatima Kama, whilst he was actually talking online to his mother and brother in Lebanon. He was adored by his mother. He adored his mother. And that was eventually his downfall because he couldn't refrain from being in contact with her. Whilst you can't possibly excuse a murderer for committing murder, you also, I think, have to accept 
that not everybody sets out with that as their as their end game. They become almost a victim of the circumstances that they've created and they should take responsibility for, but nonetheless, it's in, it impacts on them because they're human beings and they have the same processes as, as everybody else. Yusuf Wahid's need to be in constant touch with his family ultimately resulted in his arrest. Yusuf was very arrogant when he was arrested in Bahrain. He first of all denied that he was Yusuf Wahid. He also said, look, I've never been to this flat that you say that this woman was murdered in. And the evidence pack that we provided for the extradition included the CCTV of him leaving the block of flats together with the fingerprints that were found in the flat. The evidence of the fingerprints collected from Fatima's flat provides immediate proof that Wahid is lying. They show the man they have in custody had been inside Fatima's Paddington flat. Now they need to get him back to the UK. He vehemently fought against extradition to the UK, but what didn't help him was that he actually entered Bahrain illegally. So the Bahrainian authorities said, no, you will be deported from Bahrain and you're going to be deported to the UK on an extradition warrant. Yusuf Wahid finally arrives back in the UK at 6.30 a.m. on the 8th of September 2010. The UK does not have an extradition treaty with Bahrain and Wahid is the first person ever to have been extradited from the country. Charged with the murder of Fatima Kama, he's held on remand until his trial at the Old Bailey the following year, August 2011. Yusuf denies being responsible for her death, but once in court, he refuses to speak. Yusuf Wahid sacked three legal teams, his counsel defended himself. He had no legal background. I think it's a combination of arrogance, being dismissive, to the authorities, thinking I've got away with this for 12 years, I can get away with it again, and thinking, how can I disrupt this process? He refused to attend court on several occasions. He turned up occasionally and then disappear again. I think he was going for a mistrial of sorts. But Yusuf Wahid's last ditch attempts to escape justice are in vain. Having a mistrial as your aim it isn't a strategy because all that would happen following a mistrial is there'd be another trial. And to try to engineer the circumstances where a mistrial was declared would be almost impossible. Justice will be served however many times the process has to be gone through. A year later, he was convicted of the murder of Fatima Kama. The sentence in the UK for murder is mandatory life imprisonment with a recommendation and his recommendation of tariff was 24 years imprisonment. Judge Paul Worsley QC sentenced uh, Yusuf Wahid to 24 years in prison before he can be considered for parole. In his closing remarks, he said, you are an intelligent but devious and manipulative man, he told Yusuf. There is indication of significant physical suffering before her death. You callously concealed her body in a suitcase. I am entirely satisfied, he said, that your intention was to kill. There has been no flicker of remorse shown by you, and you have refused to participate in proceedings and have refused to come to court, believing mistakenly that you could abort the trial thereby. Justice is not so easily thwarted. The judge said, you have done your utmost to avoid conviction for her murder, and you have failed. Fatima's money and jewellery were never recovered, but Yusuf Wahid's sentencing on the 3rd of October 2011 brings the investigation to a successful conclusion. It also gave to me a great sense of satisfaction that officers that looked painstakingly at CCTV for days on end Officers that conducted house to house, that found the concierge, that found the forensic evidence, that found all that evidence and put that package together that was so powerful that convicted Yusuf Wahid, even though he didn't sit in court, even though there were no closing speeches because there were no 
teams to give those speeches. Yusuf said nothing, but a jury found him guilty of the murder of Fatima Karma. We've done our job properly. It was always a personal satisfaction, and when he went down for 24 years, it was a great satisfaction. I felt for the family, I felt for the community as a whole, and again, I go back to poor Fatima. You know, she's 28 years of age, she's in London, she's looking forward to potentially a career as a singer, with a record deal, etc., along those lines, which is what she wanted, and she ended up murdered. Yusuf Wahid is serving a life sentence for killing Fatima Kama, but it took over a decade to secure his conviction in the British courts, and as a result, the case against his younger brother collapsed. Although Adel Wahid was charged with assisting an offender, the Crown Prosecution Service dropped the charge while Yusuf was on the run. Fatima Kama was in the prime of her life, one of glamour and excitement. But she was robbed of the chance to leave her mark on the world when a callous and arrogant man, who she only briefly knew, decided to kill her. This case proves that however long you hide or however far you run, you can't escape justice forever. <laughs>